Merriweather is one of Newcastle's most famous and popular swimming and surfing beaches. Its surf club was established 86 years ago and was once one of the region's strongest. Over the last six years though, membership has dropped by more than 50% and lifesavers admit they just can't do their job with the current numbers. We use the uh, IRB to rescue people, which does the most rescues nowadays, and it takes two of our patrol members, so that would only leave two members on the beach. And if we have less than four, that stretches our limits uh, uh, enormously. Club membership now stands at 50. Of those, about 20 are committed, competitive lifesavers who don't mind doing their patrols. But they too might be forced elsewhere if the Surf Life Saving Association decides to penalise the club for not providing the required manpower. We could in fact uh, be banned from competition and um, have to make up patrol hours to fulfil their requirements as, as a punishment for not doing what's you know, expected of us. An advertising campaign is trying to entice people back into the surf life saving movement and the Merriweather Club will hold a crisis meeting on Sunday. As the plaque was unveiled by Federal Land Transport Minister Bob Brown and the barriers lifted, another section of the F3 freeway was open to traffic. The new stretch incorporating the Palmers Road interchange will benefit traffic travelling to Newcastle via Toronto by cutting out the Freeman's Waterhole roundabout. But the four kilometre section is relatively insignificant when you consider what lies ahead for the Roads and Traffic Authority. By 1993 the freeway will pass behind Killingworth, West Walls End and Minmai, joining up with the revamped Lenigan's Drive. A massive project which is costing the federal government around $10 million a kilometre to construct. Construct. All up, it's estimated the project will cost state and federal governments $1 billion. We're looking at a total of $1,000 million between Sydney and Newcastle. It's really one of the great highways of the world. When this final 20 kilometre stretch of the freeway is completed in 1993, more than 6 million cubic metres of earth will have been removed. Included in that is Australia's largest single earth cutting. 1.3 million cubic metres of soil directly behind Minmai will be removed in the next few months. But the size of the project has created problems. Near Barnsley, surface coal has had to be treated or removed to make way for the freeway. Now those coal seams, which of course some became exposed, some have had to be sealed in order to prevent the erosion, undercutting the sandstone overhang and also to prevent spontaneous combustion causing it to come on fire. There's been a lot of work which has been undertaken. The RTA, however, has taken full advantage of the valuable resource by selling some of it on the open market. It's unknown how much money has been raised, but according to Bob Brown, the funds have been put back into road construction. Jody McKay for MBN News. In tonight's MBN News, a further section of the Sydney to Newcastle freeway open to traffic. But the four kilometre section is relatively insignificant when you consider what lies ahead for the Roads and Traffic Authority. Newcastle's RSPCA is being forced to kill 130 cats each day. Many are being abandoned by families that can't be bothered caring for their pets over the Christmas break. These eight-week-old kittens are perfectly healthy, but unless they find a home, they'll be dead within days. 
our destruction lists are anything up to perhaps 20 dogs and puppies per day um, and certainly on average 130 cats and kittens per day. More than 160 cats are surrendered or abandoned each day. A fraction of those are kept at the animal shelter where they are given two weeks to entice an owner. The vast majority are killed immediately. The RSPCA says Christmas is the worst time of year for animal neglect. A lot of our calls and response calls for our inspectors at this point of time are horses left without water, uh, dogs left with tin roof kennels, it's too hot for them, or simply abandoned um, animals while people have gone away, they just choose to ignore the fact that their animal is at home. Some animals are frequent visitors. This German Shepherd was bought from the shelter just two weeks ago. He was found abandoned a week later. Although the aim is to find homes for as many animals as possible, the RSPCA doesn't want a rash of Christmas shoppers. I would ask everybody please, if you anticipate purchasing an animal as a gift, clear it with the people that you are buying it for. In a lot of cases they can't cope, don't want to cope. Those who genuinely want an animal can call the shelter on this number, 5155555. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. The surfaced post-mortem was held at the Newcastle Chamber of Commerce. The general consensus was that although the contest was a success, changes will have to be made. And that is a festival for Newcastle involving a hell of a lot more activities than just the surfing. The surfing, international surfing event, would be the uh, jewel in the crown of this festival. And, and if the organising committee um, can achieve that, then uh, we're off and running for uh, 91 or 92. The most likely scenario is a contest in March 1992. The BHP Steel International would open the world circuit and be part of a stronger Australian leg of the professional tour. It gives us a lot more lead time to get the sponsorship and promotional package together and it also fits in with a, uh, a, a um, proposal of the world body that the Australian Grand Slam leg be concentrated in March, April and that there be no spring leg in Australia. Since William IV was built as a bicentennial project, it's been in debt. But according to its new owners, all that's going to change. Port Stephens and Newcastle councils have each pledged $100,000 to Westpac to secure the ship's future. Today, the title to the vessel was handed over by Ian Campbell of Ernst & Young, the ship's official manager. In the next year, $125,000 must be raised to get the ship completely out of debt and operating under its own steam. A joint committee will be established to oversee the ship's management, but both councils are confident that under the umbrella of the Newcastle Regional Museum, the ship will become a viable project. Well, it doesn't have the uh, massive debt that's caused by interest payments having to be made and uh, the amount of money to run it without that interest debt can be earned by the vessel from a week to week, month to month basis. Under its new owners, the ship's first job is in Port Stephens this weekend, where it will take full advantage of the busy tourist season.
office workers stood by as firefighters donned breathing apparatus and protective clothing to reach the spill on the third floor of the building. The emergency centred on a malfunctioning photocopying machine, which was leaking highly concentrated liquid ammonia, a chemical which is extremely poisonous. Concerns were held for office workers above the spill, as ammonia fumes are lighter than air and thus tend to rise. Firefighters neutralised the chemical with soda ash, and the remainder of a 20-litre drum of the substance was removed and destroyed. The area was declared safe around 45 minutes after the spill, but taking no chances, firefighters dispersed any remaining fumes by opening the windows in the building. Detectives are concerned by the intensity of the attack on an 18-year-old girl outside her home on Helen Street late on Monday night. The girl was attacked from behind by a man who was lying in wait for her. He used her belt to choke her, but on the verge of blacking out, she managed to scratch his face, leaving what police hope will be easily identifiable wounds. She's also given police a good description of the attacker. He was in his late 20s with dark curly hair and a moustache. He's about 183 centimetres tall and of medium build. Anyone recognising the man is asked to call Newcastle Police Station on 290999. Repeating that number, 290999. Tertiary institutions began training nurses in 1985, replacing the traditional hospital-based system. Recent media reports indicate that the change from hospital to university has brought problems, with some students struggling with a more demanding academic component. Science subjects have been identified as a particular problem, with failure rates reportedly on the increase. Unofficial figures supplied today by the Newcastle University Student Representative Council suggest that science is proving difficult for some trainee nurses. In second year about 170 students fail the science module of the nursing diploma and that equates to over 50% of students in the course. The School of Nursing acknowledges that this year's second year science results are atypical, but lecturers flatly deny the validity of the figures supplied by the students. Well, second year may be a little bit higher at the moment, but of course, as we've indicated, this is purely hypothetical because results have not yet been formalised, and until they're ratified, obviously nothing is, uh, is available. The university stands by its nursing training, rejecting suggestions of an undue emphasis on science. I believe that one of the purposes of uh, moving nursing education into the tertiary sector was to educate the nurses and to give them this sort of strong comprehensive uh, academic foundation for their uh, nursing care so that they would uh, leave this tertiary institution as professionals, health professionals, equal to all the other health professionals with whom they will be working when they are out there in the health uh, setting. They are being pushed too far along um, scientific lines but possibly the departments have a justification for that because it, is, it used to be semi-professional, now it's becoming a lot more professional. Despite the denials by academic staff, the Students' Council insists its information on this year's failure rate in science modules is close to the truth. Due to delays caused by academic bans, the official results will not be available until next month. Leslie Robinson, NBN News.
The Commission found that if expanded, the smelter could operate in a satisfactory and acceptable manner and therefore has recommended development consent be granted subject to certain conditions. One of these is that the public be allowed access to all environmental monitoring information. The report also deals with the environmental issues raised during the inquiry. In response to concerns about air pollution, the Commission found that sulphur dioxide emissions from the expanded smelter would have minimal impact on air quality and that the smelter can operate without adverse effects on water quality in the Tomago Sandbeds and Hunter River. It does though recommend that additional monitoring be undertaken by the company. In respect to waste, the Commission believes there is sufficient capacity at the Wallaroo site to handle the increase in non-hazardous waste which will be generated. Tomago, however, is to devise new techniques to deal with waste currently held on site. All in all, the report is favourable, stating that during construction of the third potline, up to 1,500 extra workers will be employed, with almost 300 permanent positions created. Production will increase by 75% to 420,000 tonnes of aluminium per year, most of which will be exported to Asia. It's now up to Local Government Minister David Hay to give final approval, but General Manager Barry Goldstiver is confident that will be forthcoming. The bombshell was dropped at midday, just two hours after Carrington Slipways Managing Director Don Laverick was told the Commonwealth Bank was foreclosing. So he had nothing he could do but to call all the workforce together to tell them that the yard would be shut and that when they came back on January the 2nd they would be under the control of the receivers. For the shipyard's 450 workers it was the worst possible scenario. Just four days before Christmas, Mary McGill of the Amalgamated Metal Workers Union says there's no guarantee when the shipyard reopens on January 2nd under the control of receivers Price Waterhouse, there will be jobs for the workers to return to. The workers and now the families of Carrington Slipway's 450 employees are of course in total shock. For the company's founding family, the Lavericks, it was the final nail in a coffin that has been building around them for more than a year. In a brief statement today, Don Laverick cited three main reasons for the failure. The company's participation in the ill-fated Anzac frigate contract bid, losses incurred during the building of the icebreaker Aurora Australis, caused by the liquidation of designer Watsilla Marine, and the postponement of the RAN Minehunter contract. But according to Mrs McGill, both Treasurer Paul Keating and Industry Minister John Button, when hearing of the shipyard's problems in recent weeks, were quick to lay the blame elsewhere. They have claimed that they believe the problems were behind bad management, but uh, now we also believe that this would come as a shock to both the federal government and ourselves as far as the receiver moving in. But Mrs McGill insists the time for finger pointing is past and already her union and the ACTU have begun lobbying aggressively to the federal government to help the company live on. We still hope that the receivers will, when they look into Carrington, will see that it would be a viable concern. We have to maintain those jobs in Newcastle for the workers and the overflow of work that goes to other industries. A major factor in the workers' favour, the still uncompleted ANL vessel Sea Road Tamar. The $36 million ship is still four months away from completion. There will be discussions held with ANL, the receivers and the unions to look at how many employees they will maintain under what sort of uh, payment would be made and who would pay their wages on the 2nd of January to finish that vessel. With police in hot pursuit, the car left the road, turning sharply into heavy scrub where it crashed into a stand of trees. The stolen vehicle was spotted heading north on the Wanji Road, apparently doubling back along the western side of the lake after the robbery of the Nordsworth Post Office at about midday. Police managed to catch one of the trio before he could slip into the undergrowth. Detectives immediately began questioning the 26-year-old Coffs Harbour man. Inside the vehicle, they found a sawn-off firearm and a quantity of cash. Before 
Singapore police could prepare a search plan, golfers from the nearby Toronto Country Club reported seeing two youths in jeans and dark t-shirts sprinting across the fairways. Dozens of heavily armed police combed the course. Detectives with the armed hold-up squad were taking no chances. And the intelligence sources that we've got suggest that they possibly are armed with further uh, at least one other firearm. A police tracker dog joined the search half an hour later but was unable to pick up the scent as the fugitives apparently used cover of a heavily timbered creek to slip through the net. After half an hour of fruitless patrols, another police car sighted one of the men crossing the nearby highway into even thicker scrub. While police cordoned off the site, a helicopter was called in to join the search from the air. Despite an intensive hunt, police finally returned to normal patrols at about four o'clock. In the meantime, police are warning residents in isolated properties around Toronto to lock their doors tonight. They are dangerous and uh, they should be approached with caution and as I've said, uh, any members of the public that have information is to contact the police emergency number straight away. Patches of oil were noticed on Redhead Beach last night, but it wasn't until this morning that the extent of this spill became known. Beach Inspector Wally Berwick notified the State Pollution Control Commission around 7 o'clock. By that time, oil could be seen along a three-kilometre stretch. Like hunks of tar everywhere in globular form. It was thought that seaweed scattered along the waterline had trapped most of the oil, but swimmers and surfers reported seeing patches of the substance in the water. Body board had just come in, there's pools of it still coming in. Yeah, I got it all over my fins and board, all over my feet, sticks to you everywhere. Although there's been no bird life affected by the spill so far, that might not be the case by later tonight. As the tide is coming in, it's washing the oil back out to sea. And that's where the birds are most likely to come in contact with the oil. To stop the oil being swept back out to sea, the council beach cleaner was brought in. Although the spill seemed concentrated in the redhead area, according to the State Pollution Control Commission, clumps of the substance had been noticed as far south as Catherine Hill Bay. It's believed the oil had been in the water for about 48 hours. The Maritime Services Board will compare samples of the spill with that from ships currently anchored off the coast. Under the Clean Waters Act, the offending vessel faces a maximum fine of $100,000. Jody McKay for MBN News.